Welcome back to the Thermo Diet Podcast. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, Georgie Dinkov, also known as Hada. Georgie Dinkov is very active in the bioenergetic community, and he's a common guest with Ray Pete on the Generative Energy Podcast with Danny Roddy. And he's just a very knowledgeable and very smart guy. Really an honor to talk to Georgie and pick his brain for everything he knows. So stay tuned. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the Thermo Diet Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Miller, and I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Tyler Woodward. How are we doing today, Jaden? I'm doing well. And we also have a very special guest on today, Mr. Georgia Dinkoff. Hi, everybody. So I'm sure if you're aware, if you're in the bioenergetics community, you obviously have heard of Georgie and his company, Idea Labs. But Georgie, you want to just give a quick, quick background? Uh, yeah, I've been basically uh, uh, reading or uh, participating in the bioenergetic community probably around since circa 2011. Uh, but I've been uh, dabbling in um, biochemistry and bioinformatics uh, for since 2002. In fact, that's what first got me into the whole biochemical field, uh, is that I was working as a uh, IT guy for uh, basically an outfit here that was doing a lot of biochemical research. Um, and being an IT guy, you know, I work, I'm working, I'm surrounded by 40, 50 really bright at least so I thought at the time, <laughs> very bright medical people. And uh, if you want to participate in their community, you have to learn the language in order to be able to speak to them. Um, so that's how I got into this. Between 2002 and 2005, I worked along those people and uh, sort of acquired a little bit of the lingo. And after that, it's been all reading PubMed studies and experimenting with myself. Uh, I was a low carber for several years. That backfired badly for me. Uh, and then around 2011, I basically um, stumbled upon Dr. Pete's work, Ray Pete, by searching, by Googling, um, you know, trying to find some information on aspirin and its effects on the brain. And one day I typed aspirin brain and then one of the top results, which is no longer the case, by the way, because Google is now censoring, uh, was Dr. Pete's article on uh, aspirin and brain and cancer. Um, and that's how I got into this whole bioenergetic field. And um I've been working on it ever since, um, and now I'm even starting to do my own studies, my own experiments with animals, uh, and hopefully human studies soon as well. Um, and so far, everything that I've seen, um, even if it doesn't 100% confirm the bioenergetic idea, it most certainly invalidates almost everything that uh, we've been told by the experts on, on media. Um, in fact, there is this, uh, I think there's this website called 180 Degree Health, which basically says if you don't want to worry and, and think about things too much, it's effectively take whatever your doctor is telling you and do the exact opposite, and you'll be right nine times out of the time if you don't want to put any thought into it. That's uh, funny. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, not wrong in a lot of cases, at least. So we've got a cu couple questions prepared for you, or more than a couple questions. And the topic of this podcast predominantly is going to be on EFAs. So just as like a pre background for our listeners, like the EFAs are essential fatty acids or the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, which have multiple double bonds. Omega-3 stands for every three bonds. They have a double bond. Omega-6 is six double bonds. So they have between three and six double bonds total, which makes them highly unstable and much more likely to undergo lipid peroxidation among a number of other things. So um, a lot of Dr. Pete's work pref is based on this idea that these EFAs are in somewhat not essential or unnecessary, and that when your diet is deficient in the EFAs, omega-3 and omega-6s, that you start to produce this omega-9 known as meat acid, and the meat acid can take a, play a large role in the body and take a lot of, or be used instead of these omega-3s and omega-6s. So my question is, are the EFAs truly unnecessary? Like, do we not need them at all? Or is it just that we, it's pretty impossible to be deficient in them because they're in everything. The question on their efficiency has never really, really been fully resolved because most of the studies that that, that work with those uh, continuously cite each other in a sort of like a uh, they create this loop, and then the ones that are referring to the original, I call it the original evil, is the study by Burr and Burr. Uh, uh, by basically a, a professional medical professional and his wife, who I think did the only true experimental study uh, back in the 1930s. And then they discovered that if you deprive the animals of the omega-6 fatty acids, they basically develop various dermatological symptoms, such as uh, a scaly skin, or sometimes the skin may actually crack. Uh, they're prone to bleeding. Um, and basically, they, they don't grow as much, no matter how much food you give them. 
and this kind of already kind of uh, gives you a hint of what really the effects of the of the uh, the polyunsaturated fats and their deficiency really is it, their metabolic regulator. Um, and then he he basically concluded that even though these rats didn't die, they were actually pretty fine. Um, just the the external the, their external appearance wasn't very <laughs> um, you know uh, pleasing. So he decided he and his wife decided that this is essentially a pathological state. Um, and he termed it, you know, he termed those essential, uh, these fat acids essential. In other words, that are essential for health. Um, and ever since then, actually initially between the 1930s and maybe until the 1960s and, until uh, the real pro-PUFA campaign began, their usage wasn't very widespread in the diet. It was actually only added in commercial foods, which, of which there weren't that many. Most people were cooking their food at home. They were only added in very small amounts because the burrs basically stipulated how much that would be needed to prevent an essential fatty acid deficiency. And according to them, for a human, that would be between one and three grams daily. Um, so that's really what the usage was commercially. Um, and but you know, let me tell you that right now we're consuming the majority of the fats that we're eating from commercial food is actually polyunsaturated fats. So instead of one to three grams daily, which was to prevent the EFA deficiency, even assuming it was actually bad, uh, we're basically now consuming you know 70 to 80 grams of PUFO daily. Uh, that's really uh, you know that's not what even the birds intended. Um, but then subsequent studies demonstrated uh, it's sort of like a peripheral finding that the animals that are essential fatty acid deficient, they seem to be remarkably resilient to a, a host of assaults that are commonly used in the lab. Like if you inject them with a lethal dose of endotoxin, basically none of the rats or the mice or the rabbits that, are, that were made EFA deficient, none of them died. Uh, endotoxin can be reliably lethal beyond a certain dosage, and they even have established like those those ranges which are lethal, you know, LD30, LD50, etc. For pretty much all the species that are out there, including for humans, um, and they, they they discovered that you know experimentally those animals that were EFA deficient, they were very resilient to to endotoxin death. They were very resilient to carcinogens. They were very resilient to ionizing radiation. So basically, they will have to irradiate them with, a, with a, the equivalent of 20 to 30 times the lethal dose that will kill a normal animal or a normal human, meaning non-EFA deficient. Um, so it's almost like these rats could survive a nuclear war, um, you know, uh, if they're, you know, sufficiently distanced from the actual blast that will kill them from the heat. But if, you know, as, as far as exposure to radiation goes, it, it looked like these animals were remarkably resilient. The dermatological symptoms and, and some of the hematological symptoms were still there, but it was never really resolved if those were caused by the actual absence of the essential fatty acids or was there was something else in play. Um, and then subsequent studies with mostly people who have been on total parenteral nutrition, so-called, they, you know, maybe they've had their, like their gastrointestinal tract resected and taken out. People with Crohn's disease sometimes have that, their entire colon or other portions of the GI tract removed. So some of them may actually be on a, you know, on a intravenous slash parenteral nutrition for life. And it's, somewhat common in those people to develop essential fatty acid deficiency. I mean, there are multiple cases that is demonstrating that in such people, most of the inflammatory symptoms completely resolve, um, even though the dermatological symptoms uh, uh, appeared again. And some of the studies focused on the uh, neonatal uh, state of essential fatty acid deficiency and what happens to babies when they are, um, when they are fatty acid deficient and when they're not. And several studies that I've found demonstrated, so first of all, most of the studies that are claiming that deficiency in omega-3 or omega-6 will cause mental retardation uh, or growth stunt and, and delayed development are actually based on preterm uh, children. Now, for those, th these are already established risks. This is not something that the ESA, EFA deficiency actually caused de novo by itself. Uh, any preterm infant is a dramatically higher risk of premature death I mean, many of them don't even survive uh, 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 by the uh, until the age of one. Uh, and then even if they do survive, then basically they have multiple organ damage, uh, stunted growth, and of course, cognitive issues. And then the studies that looked at the essential fatty acid deficiency in such babies, I found quite a few that basically stated that with the exception of the dermatological symptoms, uh, you know, almost all of the infants were doing perfectly fine. Now, what did happen is that the infants that were on a really, truly uh, in state of EFA deficiency, they all of them, without exception, had a dramatically higher resting metabolic rate. 
Now, of course, now you can kind of imagine why the studies that, that saw, you know, that, that wasn't with premature infants and that still had EFA deficiency, why they may have found growth growth stunt and, and cognitive issues later in life. Well, if these babies have a, you know, two times higher metabolic rate and you still continue feeding them the calories that are being, you know, designated for regular babies with regular metabolism, well, of course, you're basically malnourishing them. They, they will have developmental problems and cognitive problems as well. Uh, and multiple studies found out that that was actually the only difference that they could find between the two groups is that the EFA deficient babies had a much higher metabolic rate and wanted to consume, you know, much higher amount of calories. Uh, and many doctors were taken aback and said, no, nah, it's not good. It's going to get the baby, you know, obese, uh, even by very early age. You know, we're not supposed to be feeding a baby two times more calories daily than the, what the baby is supposed to eat. Yeah, but who is saying how much is a baby or an adult supposed to eat? All depends on your metabolic rate. Anyways, back to the back to the symptoms of EFA deficiency. Uh, some studies have suggested that many of those symptoms can be uh, removed or greatly mitigated by feeding additional amounts of zinc uh, or the B vitamins and or could be both uh, into the diet, which suggests that basically the reason for the appearance of these dermatological symptoms is simply again because of the higher metabolic rate. Not only you're consuming, uh, and if you continue to eat the same amount of calories as what medicine is telling you as an adult or you know a preterm infant should be eating, then you will be by definition getting into a multiple nutrient deficiency. Uh, biotin deficiency can cause the the symptoms of of associated with EFA deficiency. Uh, zinc deficiency can cause these. Uh, selenium deficiency can cause a lot of these problems with nails and hair that are also being seen. Um, now, the one thing that is probably true of essential fatty acid deficiency is that it will decrease platelet aggregation, so it may make you more, more prone to bleeding, but it's it's not clear that this effect is, is stronger than what uh, like a tablet of aspirin will do daily. And in fact, if anything, we're actually more prone to clotting than we are to bleeding. Uh, very few people out there are truly prone to bleeding and only those that are taking war for it. And even for those people, they don't really give them anything. They just say, well, we need to monitor you like every you know couple of months just to make sure you know you have to go for a surgery or you hurt yourself that you're not, you're not bleeding to death. Uh, and, and EFA deficient people are nowhere near that level, right? So all of this uh, fear mongering about you know uh, e e essential fatty acid deficiency making you uh, prone to bleed to that, that has never been shown, not even one case, um, or at least never been published. Um, on the other hand, all of these uh, sort of like mostly cosmetic symptoms, such as skin problems, hair problems, etc., uh, seem to be resolvable by simply uh, both increasing the calories to match the increased metabolic needs and also increasing the amount of nutrients uh, correspondingly so that they match the increase in calories and the increase in the, you know, in the needs of the metabolic rate. However, studies on this have not been done. We don't know if your metabolic rate doubles, whether you need twice the amount of zinc or maybe even more. Uh, the the requirements for the micro, for the micronutrients don't always grow uh, linearly with the increase in the, in the metabolic rate. Sometimes they grow exponentially, uh, sometimes logarithmically. I mean, for something like uh, vitamin D, um, actually the, the the requirements with increased metabolic rate grow, grow grow logarithmically, but for vitamin A, grow exponentially. So without actually doing these studies, uh, and none of them have been done, we don't really know. But what we do know is that uh, basically. All of the metabolic problems or developmental problems associated with essential fatty acid deficiency are actually mostly no. They don't. They don't. They're not, they're not really problems per se, except that if you're restricting, if you're not providing enough food for the resultant increase in the metabolic rate associated with essential fatty acid deficiency, and then also, you know, conversely, the the not conversely, but in addition, the cosmetic symptoms such as mostly related to skin and hair. Um, are actually largely solvable by providing even one or you know or just a few of the nutrients that are known to increase with increased metabolic rate. And, and even without any studies, we already know that just giving bit a little of extra zinc, maybe you know instead of 10 milligrams daily, you consume 20, is enough to mitigate most of the symptoms. Um, so I have not seen any evidence uh, basically that says uh, that that provides clear clear evidence, uh, I've, not, I've not seen any conclusive evidence that essential fatty acid deficiency is actually pathological in the long run. Uh, having <laughs> poor skin, uh, what well, you know, poor skin, having scaly skin um, and, and dry hair and, and maybe brittle nails is not necessarily a sign of pathology. It's a sign, it could be a sign just of a nutrient deficiency, right? Not of necessarily of the body, something developing some kind of a disease. 
Um, and uh, so the so the bigger argument, the biggest argument that that's come in favor of the essential fatty acids is usually from the studies with babies. They'll say, well, the baby seems to be accumulating a lot of omega three uh, just before gestation, just before birth, and it seems to accumulate preferentially into the retina in the brain. Right, and without those omega threes, you're gonna have like retarded babies and blind babies and whatnot. Um, well, a couple of things that could explain the the preferential accumulation. Um, the baby basically is absorbing most of these fatty acids uh, from the blood. In other words, from whatever the, the the mother is eating, whatever the mother is providing. And now we have studies showing that when the mother eats a combination, a mixture of different fats. Um, the saturated fats are preferentially oxidized in the mother's organism. And then the the, uh, po the polyunsaturated fats, both omega-3 omega and 6, uh, are actually being uh, esterified, converted to triglycerides, and sent out in the peripheral circulation for storage and consumption by, by other tissues, right? Uh, so it's normal if the mother is eating uh, you know, high fatty meal or the mother is under stress or she's experiencing lipolysis, yeah, because the, since the, these these omega the the, the polyunsaturated fats are preferentially stored both in the mother's body and the baby, if the mother is under stress, even if she's not consuming a high fat meal, then the fats that she releases into her bloodstream, eventually going to the baby, are also mostly PUFA. So it is kind of expected that the baby will accumulate, uh, uh, you know, omega three and even omega six. Some studies have said that you know if you don't provide omega three, the baby will accumulate omega six. Well, of course. <laughs> it will basically, these are both PUFAs and that's what you will accumulate. However, studies have shown that basically if you if you provide a sufficient amount of saturated fat in the diet of the mother, this preferential accumulation of omega-3 and omega-6 into the baby does not occur. Uh, consequently, studies with adults have demonstrated repeatedly that supplementation with omega-3 and God forbid omega-6 are most certainly not beneficial for neither, for neither brain development, brain function, uh, especially not for things like Alzheimer's. In fact, and I, I'll send you some studies later on so you can post it, it send to people if, if you if they want to see. Uh, two of the two of the PUFO peroxidation byproducts, malondialdehyde is malondialdehyde is one of them, and four hydroxy, uh, no, I'm sorry, three three hydroxy one enol are actually uh, very highly reliable biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and in fact, he has led he has led certain medical groups to propose. That Alzheimer's disease, because the same the same biomarkers are also associated with diabetes, has has led some medical groups to propose that Alzheimer's disease is nothing but diabetes of the brain, which is driven just like type two diabetes in general is driven by accumulation of excessive amounts of fat, and actually it's the polyunsaturated fats because they produce these lipid peroxidation byproducts, which are carcinogenic, mutagenic, and generally toxic for the organism. Um, so. The argument that omega-3 is good for the development of the babies, um, uh, I, I've not seen any conclusive study with healthy infants that will demonstrate that one group is EFA deficient and the other one gets omega-3. And again, we're not talking about preterm infants because for preterm infants, nothing can really be said conclusively because they're already in, in pretty poor health. But for the healthy ones, I don't know of any studies that show that if you give one group the omega-3 and you feed the other ones, let's say, uh, an omega-3 poor or omega-6 omega poor, in other words, poof or poor diet, that somehow the second group will end up in a worse situation health-wise than the first one. So what do you think about, I'm not an expert on this, but the quantum theory of DHA, DHA and that its properties, because of its unsaturation it, as an electron carrier, and basically that we evolved eating animal fats, which are higher in DHA and whatnot. And that is necessary for us to see it the way we do in our brain to function as fast as it does. Um, to me, that didn't really make a lot of sense because you would think the saturated fats would be a much more efficient energy carrier because they're, you know, the double bonds are basically like a, a fence. And every time they, in like, they got to be open and closed versus the saturated fat is basically just, or a gate versus the saturated fat is just like a fence that carries electricity very rapidly through it versus it has to go through that gate every time. So what do you think about like the role of DHA in evolution? A couple of things. Uh, the, all of the evolutionary biology arguments are very nice. Unfortunately, none of them can be tested in the lab. We just cannot reproduce evolution in the lab, right? If I wanted to test something like this, I'll have to I'll have to have a way to reproduce evolution uh, in a matter of like let's say a couple of months or at most a year. Nobody's going to fund thirty year plus studies. Uh, and even those won't be enough because we're not going to change genetic. We're not going to cause genetic changes, uh, even in a in a in a in a time span of a full human life. Uh, those occur over tens of thousands of years, uh, and as biology teaches us, they're random, right? Um, so 
one thing I'll say is that, um, so basically, uh, first of all, people who are EFA deficient, they, they don't go blind, okay? They don't go blind. In fact, they have increased sensitivity uh, to light and they're capable and they develop a bit of a, of a farsightedness, uh, which if anything speaks to an improvement in both in, 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 in either the retinas, photosensitivity or the brain's ability, ability to process the signal that's coming from the retina. Second thing, uh, macular degeneration, which is a disease of the retina, which happens used to happen in elderly people, now is basically rapidly increasing in the middle age groups and even the young people as well. And diabetics, it can be reliably as well, right? induced. Exactly, diabetics as well. It can actually it immediately will tells you that the issue here is basically if diabetes is a disease of excessive fatty acid accumulation and mostly PUFA, then it's probably the PUFA is not going to be beneficial for this condition, but. Of course, this is still just a hypothesis, but there's also experimental evidence now showing that if you feed uh, animals basically a sufficient amount of omega-3 or omega-6, or worse, both, then you're basically increasing uh, the rates of the macular degeneration. Uh, macular degeneration has a very close correlation with, with the accumulation of lipofuscin, and lipofuscin cannot form without the presence of either omega-3 or omega-6. And by the way, the omega-3 generated much more easily because they're much more easily peroxidized. So the lipofuscin is essentially a combination of, of a, one of the proof of peroxidation byproducts and iron. Uh, so it forms this really like hard to dissolve uh, gunk, which accumulates in many cells, but the retina and the brain are especially susceptible to it. And accumulation in the retina of lipofuscin is c considered to be one of the causes uh, or at least very highly correlated with the development of macular degeneration. So if feeding animals omega-3 and omega-6 can actually cause retinal degeneration in young adults and elderly people, then uh, to me, the argument you know, uh, that we should be feeding it to babies is uh, without any evidence. I haven't seen any evidence that feeding it to babies is detrimental, but I certainly don't see, I have not seen so far any evidence that we have to have, we have to feed it for babies because it's somehow essential for the development of their brain or vision. There is no evidence for that. In that regard, so do you think it's most of the lipid peroxidation, which is like when the free radicals hit everything in the cell, bouncing around and cause lipid peroxidation, the base of those double bonds to break apart, which form, results in the formation of like malandal, MDA, malandaldehyde, like the base which is like glue that just wrecks the cell. Do you think it's worse? Is that mostly from lipid peroxidation from the iron, what's not reacting in the cell, or is it from the oxidizing of the PUFAs in the cell, or is it both? No, no well, no, the, the oxidation of the PUFA in the cell, uh, I mean, basically, whether it's a PUFA or, or saturated fat is, is fairly, it's effectively the same. The better oxidation is this repeated cycl cyclical process that cuts off like two molecules every single time until the whole chain is exhausted, right? And then it gets converted into acetyl-CoA and gets fed into the Krebs cycle. So that process is fine. However, just the presence of the PUFA, because there's molecular oxygen and, and, and hydroxyl radicals floating uh, you know, around, uh, they're always subject to basically portion of them reacting with that uh, hydroxyl radical or the, or the superoxide anion and forming a fatty acid radical, right? Uh, and those fatty acid radicals are extremely toxic. They're known to be mutagenic and carcinogenic, right? Um, but on the other hand, the evidence for that is already conclusive. I think the NIH listed it back in 2010. Uh, it put it on its, list, on its list of known human carcinogens. So they have possible, probable, and known. So malondialdehyde moved uh, very quickly, I think, between 2001 and when, when it was on the list of possible ones. At this point, it's now on the list of no. Uh, but uh, pretty much all the, all, all the other aldehydes uh, and the ones that, it, that they scare us the most, unfortunately, turns out to be the least problematic, which is acetaldehyde, which is the first step in the metabolism of alcohol. Um, and basically they're saying, oh, alcohol, the, da the dangers associated with it is because of acetaldehyde, uh, just like malondaldehyde, we think it's, you know, but the, somehow the media attention is all on acetaldehyde and not on malondaldehyde, which, which we actually produce in a much higher amounts on a daily basis from our food, right? Unless you're alcoholic, acetaldehyde is a lot less problematic for you than malondaldehyde is, and various other aldehydes. So basically the full number of proof of peroxidation byproducts isn't known, but in, in, in basically they're all, without exception, uh, toxic aldehydes or alcohols uh, with a very unstable structure. Th these uh, um, three hydroxy one and all, I think is the one that was basically associated with Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. That's that's a type of fatty acid alcohol, but it's formed by the uh, from the peroxidation of PUFA. Um, and basically, um, it, these things continue to react because there's, uh, for as long as there's more PUFA, intact PUFA left in the body, these fatty acid radicals continue reacting with the PUFA, which is inside of the cell or even floating around in the blood. And this chain reaction continues 
until something breaks it. And the uh, you know, two most well-known chain reaction breakers are vitamin C and E, right? Um, which immediately tells you why, basically, it is so important that we consume these so-called antioxidants. But it's not really... So the question is, okay, so uh, maybe it isn't the PUFA that's the problem. Maybe it's the problem that we're generating too many reactive oxygen species, right? Okay, but even then, medicine turns out to have the whole thing backwards, right? They're saying, or on its head, they're saying, well, this is a, a sort of like a side effect of having very, very high metabolism because the mitochondria produce these reactive oxygen species. Turns out it's actually a side effect of having low metabolism because in order for these reactive oxygen species to, to form, the reason they're forming is because the electrons are not flowing unimpededly through the electron transport chain and eventually uh, meeting oxygen and forming water, right? That you accumulate at one of the electron transport, transport chain complexes, and then they start leaking outside of the inner mitochondria into the outer mitochondrial membrane and then, then into the cytosol. And that's that's when they start attacking, basically reacting with the PUFAs, right? But So you will not have accumulation of ROS if your metabolism was working properly and you were basically, this, this chain of electrons from food was flowing without any uh, hindrance, you know, from the food to the oxygen. So we're actually seeing uh, the reason we're having PUFA peroxidation is a combination of low metabolism, or at least lower than optimal, plus the consumption of PUFA. Uh, now, of course, uh, if you want to improve your metabolism by all means, means, I don't think it will fully eliminate the peroxidation of PUFA because that peroxidation can actually form uh, just by the sun shining on you, because you if you have like a lot of PUFA in your stores, uh, the, the, the process of sunburning is actually just that. It's the ultraviolet light basically activating molecular oxygen in the body, and then it starts attacking the PUFA, and then that's, that's how you get the sunburn. The sunburn is, the, is an inflammatory reaction to these toxic peroxidation byproducts that are being formed. Uh, under the skin, under the influence of ultraviolet light and in and, and the molecular oxygen. So th it's hard to make an argument in favor of PUFA, except, you know, if you look at the, some of the biggest reviews on the topic, they'll, they'll admit it. They'll say, look, if it wasn't for the essentiality of PUFA, and keep in mind, we have only one study to base this entire argument for that, that's been going on for almost 100 years, only one real experimental study. Uh, if it wasn't for the essentiality of PUFAs, they're saying there's very little that is actually positive in regards to omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Every single clinical trial with them that was large enough failed. Uh, the result was either null or, or the opposite. So you can tell if the result was the opposite uh, if the clinical trial was terminated early. That usually means there was there have been one or more serious serious adverse events, SAEs, um, and or serious adverse reaction, SARs. And that means that basically the active group that's getting the omega-3 and omega-6 supplementation uh, is fairly much more poorly than the control group or the whatever the other active groups were. So the biggest reviews on the topic concluded that had it not been for the essentiality of these fatty acids, then basically that we should not be recommending that people eat them in the amounts that we do. And even if they were essential, uh, several large reviews said, we somehow don't know how we ended up from the original Burr recommendation of between one and three grams daily to the amount that we're eating right now. Um, and the situation started with back in the 60s when the industry was starting to promote the PUFAs, uh, especially as a byproduct of the agricultural industry. Uh, but they basically, they never really said you should be eating a certain amount. Somewhere around the late 80s, somehow the uh, U.S. and in general, the Western public health industries started recommending that basically, uh, maybe because of the saturated fatty acid hypothesis. That's the keys, right? Yeah. Keys, yeah, exactly. They were saying like, well, it's not only they're essential, so you should not only be eating between one and three grams, you should be eating a lot more so that the proportion of your unsaturated to the saturated fats is at least three to one. Well, if you're consuming 100 grams of fat daily, uh, which seems to be a fair amount, most people consume about 30 to 40 grams per meal, right? Uh, that's, this means you're consuming, I don't know, what, 70, 80, even more grams of PUFA daily, um, that was not even the burst original recommendation. Uh, so so I, I think we're way out there in the weeds. Uh, people are starting to recognize that fact that uh, PUFAs are associated with disease. Um, there are now several trials with um, clinical trials using drugs that actually block some of the, the, the endpoint effects of PUFA byproducts, which is the leukotrienes and the prostaglandins. Uh, it, there's at least one clinical trial with Alzheimer's. Uh, which basically is administering a leukotriene antagonist. I think it's called Monte Lucast is the drug. 
Um, the drug is still there. I'm sorry, the trial is still there. It's in phase three, which means it's past the safety stage, past the effectiveness, I guess, I guess stage two. And now stage three, I think, is like they're they're looking at uh, a larger group before they announce. Uh, they're basically doing a multi-ethnic, multi-geographical um, you know, area studies just to confirm that the effects are statistically significant. Uh, long story short, if the study has been going on for five years, considering how expensive it is and it has not been terminated, chances are, you know, people believe that the results are, are promising. Um, yeah. And uh, again, other studies have demonstrated that if you supplement, there were older studies, that if you supplement antioxidant, especially vitamin E, uh, you can actually largely prevent, if not the actual disease, then most of the uh, uh, sort of like uh, side pathologists associated with diabetes type 2, especially kidney failure. Uh, liver disease uh, and some of the vascular pathologies that ultimately lead to things like a heart attack or stroke. Uh, and that's really the three things that, that usually do the kidney patients in are kidney failure, heart attack, or stroke. Um, and sometimes liver failure, but more rarely. It's usually if the person also drinks and uh, is using some kind of a hepatotoxic medication, which unfortunately many of them are because they're all statins and whatnot. Yeah. So I just kind of want to illustrate this for the listeners and, and you can correct me wherever um, but so if you kind of imagine like the cell, like a highway, right. And everything is the goal is to get to the, your destination where the electron acts as the terminal electron acceptor breaks apart water and forms ATP and whatnot. Sugar is the fastest. So it's going to be the most smooth, but like there's no traffic on the highway. Everything's going clear. All the electrons are flowing smoothly through. When you start to burn fat, it starts to slow down because beta hydroxy, beta hydro, what, what's the word? Beta the beta oxidation. Beta oxidation, thank you, is slower. So it results in more reactive oxidative species. So that kind of starts to build up a traffic. And the issue isn't this, the oxidative stress where it's the cars are just, let's say, hitting each other. It's this traffic that builds up. And now the stars, the, all these electrons start hitting each other because there's just a buildup of these electrons or the cars, right? So which is called, so the reductive stress is build up in traffic, causes the oxidative stress, stress because these cars or these electrons are moving through the electron transport chain at a slower rate. So it's kind of like a pinball machine where where all these things are bouncing around, hitting each other, which results in these lipid peroxidase and byproducts like malandaldehyde, the uh, three enol, the aldehydes that you were talking about. And the issue with metabolizing, not only it's partially fat, but also the PUFAs is because they have less hydrogens, correct? Because they have less electrons. That's what allows them to get peroxidized. A fully saturated fat does not have a place of attack for any of these reactive oxygen species. So if you're eating a fully saturated fat and you were EFA deficient, even if you're even if you're somehow, uh, you know, you wouldn't be hypometabolic, by the way. It's nice that these things go hand in hand. But if somehow you were administered a metabolic inhibitor to have these drugs to test in the lab and you generated a lot of reactive oxygen species, then you wouldn't be producing those highly toxic uh, uh, aldehydes uh, and, and some of the sort of like the short chain toxic unsaturated alcohols as well. The, like the, that uh, four hydroxy, three hydroxy one and all. Um, so the, to use the analogy, basically like once you have, so you have the car speeding along the highway, right? And then uh, there's basically, let's say four, four checkpoints, right? Uh, and then basically each checkpoint can handle, you know, only so many cars at a time. Um, but basically, if you're if you're in optimal health, there's no inflammation. Uh, you're probably regenerating the necessary cofactors for the processing of all these cars, so to speak, which is really electrons, right? Uh, then everything's fine. At the end is is oxygen. It accepts the the those electrons slash cars and it converts into water. Everything's fine. However, if one or more of these checkpoints starts to get uh, I don't know uh, saturated for what reason exactly, then what these cars happen is basically you can think of the highway as like a hose. So initially it's going to expand a little bit right it's going to be there's going to be an accumulation of cars around the checkpoint it's almost like exiting, exiting a toll road but eventually the cars are going to start spilling outside of the highway and those that spillage of the cars outside of the highway these cars are not peaceful <laughs> they think, think of them as criminals they will look around for vulnerable places to actually attack and those places of attack the easiest ones are the polyunsaturated fats that are going to be outside of the highway. So the highway is inside the mitochondria, and basically the fats are mostly outside of the mitochondria, outside of the highway, uh, especially around the, the outer layers of the cell, which they call the, the lipid bilayer. But, uh, I mean, that's another thing that uh, Dr. Pete does not agree with because there are multiple studies showing that even if you damage the cell, if you damage the 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 multi-layer, the lipid multi-layer, uh, then the, the cell does not lose its content, does not spill its waters outside, right? So if you're taking like minced meat, which is, you know, and you can actually continuously mince it into finer and finer pieces. So this process should be damaging a lot of the cells, but if you take minced meat and squeeze it, you will not be able to squeeze any water outside. So the, the model of the cell is a bag of water is wrong. We know that. And 
to me, actually, stunningly, apparently, there's, a, a, I mean, I saw the study. In 2014, there was a study coming out of Harvard. There's an entire team that works there. And they've been calling for at least 20 years uh, for medicine to change its attitude on the cell, that the cell should be uh, treated as a, as a like a, like a, a sphere of, made of gel, of jello. Uh, right, and they say they they brought up the same analogy. They're saying, look, just because the cell endures some damage to its surface doesn't mean it, we're not seeing and basically like spill its its entrails into into the into the surroundings. We're not seeing that. There's something else that basically, as long as the cell is alive, can maintain its electronic structure with the potassium inside, binding the proteins and creating the structured water, which is what Dr. Pollock was talking about. You basically have a, a, a coherent entity, and it does not basically like, uh, you know, let, let itself disorganize. Now, if you deprive it of ATP, which is the crucial component, so sort of like the like the cement holding holding all these proteins together, the cardinal absor absorbent, then the cell readily actually disintegrates, right? Without you actually causing any structural damage, um, which shows you why energy is so important because if ATP is the final product of this, like the highway, and actually eventually when the electrons combine with the, um, with oxygen, basically, and then there's like an, a, a, a reverse process with some of the some of the protons coming back through the you know inner mitochondrial membrane and going into ATPase and and basically creating ATP synthase, creating ATP. So if this process is not working, if you're not synthesizing enough ATP, which depends essentially on energy, uh, medicine thinks ATP is the energy. No, it's actually the final byproduct of the energetic flow, but it's a very important structural. Uh, like sort of like a component that keeps the structure together, but it depends on energy. So no energy, no ATP. And without sufficient ATP, the cell literally disintegrates uh, and all hell breaks loose. And there's, I'm not sure you've seen the studies, cellular debris in the body cause all kinds of autoimmune reactions. The body treats them as like sort of foreign pathogens because it's, you know, it's not expecting to see portions of the mitochondria floating around. Anyways, the PUFOs can actually do that as well because they interfere. They're not only, um, so their, their peroxidation byproducts are not only attacking other PUFOs and creating more uh, fatty acid radicals. The fatty acid radicals are actually capable of inhibiting multiple steps of this, of this like sort of electron flow the, on the highway. It's not just uh, four checkpoints. There's uh, things like the total, of, like maybe 27. If you if you count glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electrotransport chain, glycolysis seems to be fairly immune to any kind of in interference. Uh, and conversely, any interference with glycolysis sufficiently immediately kills the cell. Um, and there, there are very, 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 very few, very rare diseases where babies are born with mutations that basically have like impaired glycolysis. They usually don't survive beyond a week. But, the, you know, the Krebs cycle and the electric transport chain, which are inside the mitochondria, uh, they're very susceptible to, uh, if not damage, at least interference by these uh, reactive oxygen, both the reactive oxygen species and the lipid peroxidation byproducts, which, can, which, can, which means you're, you're impeding the... The, the electron flow, creating even more spillage, right? So it's like, a cha again, a chain reaction, a self-sustaining chain reaction, which unless you break it, right, and there are multiple ways to break it, it's eventually going to wreak havoc and kill the cell. And ultimately, even if it doesn't kill the cell, then it's going to cause some sort of like a, you know, un unchecked growth. So you, you, either the cell commits apoptosis uh, or it breaks apart if there's no sufficient ATP, uh, sort of like in a necrotic cell death, or and or becomes a cancerous cell, right? So all of these things can actually be caused uh, even by, uh, definitely by the PUFA peroxidation byproducts, but now we're finding out even by the actual intact PUFAs themselves because they have this sort of like an endocrine effect which stimulates cellular growth. Do you know why that people tend to supplement with molecular hydrogen? to neutralize the electrons? Is that something that's actually effective? Um, I haven't done it myself. Uh, I've seen uh, several people act doc, act doc, ask Dr. Peake. He said it's a it's an effective antioxidant. I'm imagining it probably neutralizes the superoxide anion, probably. You know, it basically converts it directly uh, into water. Um, and um, I mean, I doubt that it directly saturates the PUFAs. That would be, that would be incredible if that actually does that. Uh, but to my knowledge, it probably happens in the guts of some ruminant animals if you if you supplement them with hydrogen because they have bacteria in their like the three the three uh, portions of their GI tract. They may be able to take some of the hydrogen, extra hydrogen, and actually saturate the PUFA more easily. They do it anyways, but with extra hydrogen, it will probably be even more efficient. Uh, I think for the humans, the pr the primary effect is basically quenching. Uh, the reactive oxygen species. So if it's going to combine with hydroxy radical, you know, the, uh, break uh, and form water and same thing with a superoxide anion, right? And those are probably about 80% of your reactive oxygen species. So the only downside to burning the PUFA is just you're going to get less electrons than you get from burning saturated fat and then obviously less than 
you're going to get from glucose, which is going to result in less ATP, but it's also going to result in increase in reactive oxygen species because you're burning, because you're creating less energy. Not, not the only, that's the only downside if they're oxi- if they're basically oxidized in the cell where they are from. Ah, uh, right? okay. If, they, if, if they, they have to get spilled into the bloodstream, which usually happens under the effects of adrenaline, right? Then you have it, you're talking about a whole mm, different cascade. Okay. Uh, you're talking about the endocrine effects. You're talking about their uh, sort of like pro-inflammatory effects because some cells will convert uh, uh, the omega-6 into arachidonic acid and then to prostaglandins and leukotrienes, right? Those have universally bad effects. Nobody's denying that, not even doctors, right? Uh, then you also have the endocrine effects because because of their double bonds, they they structurally mimic the, the effects of estrogen, right? They're structurally similar to estrogen, so so the effects are similar to estrogen. They make the cell where they accumulate more hydrophilic, so the cell becomes more more permeable, more susceptible to accepting whatever's coming in from the bloodstream, uh, and especially water. And any accumulation of water, basically that 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 uh, drops both. Uh, the, I'm sorry, that increases the pH with the cell, in other words, makes it more alkaline, uh, that stimulates all kinds of growth process in the cell, and ultimately, it's cancer. So if you look at cancer uh, cells, their extracellular environment is extremely acidic because they synthesize a lot of lactic acid, but they, because it's so toxic even to the cancer cells, they immediately export it out. They're lactate transporters, which are almost with almost unlimited capacity. They immediately export it out. So the cancer cells inside, if you measure the pH, is actually almost alkaline, and it's uh, while the the extracellular space is acidic. Um, and this whole this whole uh, idea of like drinking alkaline water and whatnot, um, it may have its uses if there is any way to actually neutralize the lactic acid extracellularly. But the real problem is that the actual the, the inside of the cell is alkaline. So we, we what we need is actually us to acidify the cell. And if you acidify the cell, that allows the excess calcium that has accumulated inside to be released. And then basically you're going to have a, a blood pH, which will be slightly in the alkaline region. And then the intracellular pH will actually be slightly acidic. That's really the healthy cell because it's producing a lot of carbon dioxide, which will keep the pH a little bit lower. And then the high carbon dioxide, as it flows out of the cell, it drags calcium with it. And also the NAD to the NADH ratio, which also depends on the oxi- on the redox status of the cell, also determines how much calcium is released in the cell. The higher the NAD to the NADH ratio means the more oxidized state you are, the cell is, the more calcium we're going to get expelled from the cell. And you can imagine if you're having trouble visioning like the structured water, it's like an egg yolk, right? So you crack an egg and the egg yolk stays together. It's because of all the ATP, the proteins, that negative charge that's in the cell. And so the issue, and I like the, one of the ways I like to think about it with PUFAs structurally, right? Besides, let's say not looking at the lipid peroxidation is just that they're more watery. And so like it's more uh, nitric oxide. And so you have this influx of water. So the cells become more like this bulk water versus this egg yolk, this structured water where everything, all the proteins are tightly packed together and the cell, all the electrons can flow efficiently versus the more PUFA, the more estrogen you're going to have, the more probably cortisol, nitric oxide, which don't, which impede this flow of electrons because the cell gets more bulky. It's more bloated basically. Yes. And actually you can, uh, there's a very famous, uh, it's a prank. Well, it's not a prank, but it's something that bodybuilders practice. I will not recommend it, but if you want to confirm without any doubt that PUFA, what the effect of PUFA is, go to Google and type bodybuilding, bodybuilders injecting oil in muscles. And you'll see that basically there's this trend right now for bodybuilders before going to a competition or just to impress their friends and whatnot. They're injecting peanut oil or corn oil into their muscles. And it's precisely this, this pro edema effect of the PUFAs that are creating their muscles to swell to the point of looking almost grotesque. And, and to an outside, it looks like this guy has massive muscles. In reality, it's mostly basically it's basically mostly edema, mostly accumulation of water. Uh, there's there's great vascularity because the PUFA promote the um, inducible nitric oxide synthase. They activate it right. So, so that, that basically, it's all the things the bodybuilders want, but without having to inject steroids. Or they still inject steroids, but they may add a little bit of PUFA for the extra effect. This does not work if they inject coconut oil, which kind of should tell you, and since coconut oil is 98% saturated fat, it should tell you that it is an effect that is intrinsic to PUFA. Whether it's through their toxic byproducts or to the PUFAs themselves, PUFA in your body means edema, PUFA in your body means uh, hydrophilic cells, which means absorbing water and, and basically cellular growth and, and hypertrophy. Very interesting. Do you have anything else you want to talk about for PUFAs? Um, so what would be the benefit over vitamin E versus molecular hydrogen? Just kind of circling back to that idea. Um, vitamin E has multiple sort of like uh, endocrine effects. 
There's some older studies that show that it has a pro-androgenic effect together with vitamin A. Uh, we don't, we know also know that vitamin K has a similar effect. Um, and I think some of the endocrine effects of vitamin E come from its opposition to estrogen. Uh, two studies have shown that vitamin E, especially the alpha uh, uh molecule, but probably the other isomers as well, not the tocotrienols, but the tocopherols, uh, are capable of binding the estrogen receptor and acting there as, as antagonists. Uh, there's also a study, I've so far found only one, that showed directly that the vitamin, that, that the tocopherols, all of them, are also aromatase inhibitors. So you have like basically, a, you know, uh, one-two punch, which is very rare. Not many molecules are like that, uh, which basically have a, you know, the androgen dihydrotestosterone is another similar molecule that has the same effects, blocks the estrogen receptor and also aromatase inhibitor. So vitamin E has these beneficial sort of like anti-estrogenic effects. And in women, it seems to spare the effects of progesterone. Older studies in the 40s that were done and the 50s that were done with progesterone found that you can produce the same uh, progestation effects, in other words, to maintain pregnancy, if you mix progesterone, if you inject progesterone together with vitamin E. And they, and and by the way, they, they progesterone, they dissolved it in, in uh, I think, uh, benzyl alcohol. And then the tocopherol was alpha tocopherol acetate, which is really not the optimal uh, uh, version of vitamin you should be using. First of all, half of it is the synthetic, the, the L1, which we don't, it ha- doesn't have any effects. Second, it's also an ester, right? So you're basically getting like, if you're injecting one, I don't know, one gram, you're getting one, only one quarter of that roughly is really having the, the tocopherol effect. Even though, even that, even that like highly inefficient and potentially toxic synthetic for, form of vitamin E allowed basically to use progesterone dosage that was only one fourth of what was needed to maintain pregnancy without the injection together with the coferol. So it has a progesterone sparing effect and likely has some, some pro-progesterone effects directly at the receptor level. It's also a COX inhibitor. Uh, basically, it inhibits both cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Um, and uh, some of the metabolites of gamma and delta tocopherols, which are two of the isomers, are now known to be lipoxygenase inhibitors as well. Uh, so you have this like sort of like fairly broad anti-inflammatory effect of vitamin E, plus its endocrine effect of basically opposing estrogen, which PUFA promotes. And finally, of course, you know, the chain breaking effect against PUFA by the peroxidation. So lipoxygenase means they're inhibit, not inhibiting lipolysis, but they're, what is lipoxygenase? Uh, but, but I took, oh, you, you just reminded me. They're, so there's lipoxygenase, right? Which which creates the leukotriens, okay, like you okay. it, right? Um, so, so arachidonic acid has two pathways, uh, cyclooxygenase or lipoxygenase, right? Tocopherols in its, in, in their native state seem to inhibit uh, cyclooxygenase of which there are two, uh, isoenzymes, two isoforms, one and two, right? But then also some of their metabolites, at least the ones, the metabolites of gamma tocopherol and delta tocopherol inhibit lipoxygenase, right? And then also tocopherols seem to be able to restrain excessive lipolysis very similarly to the way aspirin and niacinamide are also capable of doing. Uh, and this this is one thing that uh, this one effect uh, led to some studies, uh, older studies, I think that, that I read in the 70s that proposed that vitamin E may be a viable treatment for diabetes because even back then they knew that, that the diabetes condition is actually, uh, you know, an excess of of fats in the blood. Yeah, of course, in the body, storage as well, but the problem is especially exacerb- exacerbate when they eat the blood. And there's this, uh, uh, there were two uh, brothers, the Shoot brothers, I think they're called. I don't know if you've heard of them. Canadian doctors. Uh, they basically, they're very famous. They're, um, if you if you uh, search their names on, uh, on Google, S-C-H-U-T-E, there were Canadian doctors and they basically like spent their entire careers, I think over 40 years, treating people with very high doses of vitamin E uh, and, and you know, the, their publications, which medicine continues to claim, they were just case studies. Yes, they are, because they didn't have a control group. But if they publish 4,000 successful cases of cured diabetes type 2 with vitamin E, I would personally take notice. But, of course, not modern medicine. What are your thoughts on the auto-oxidation of, of the vitamin E when you have, I think it's mostly, it was shown in plants, but, like, you put enough vitamin A, or, sorry, vitamin E as alpha tocopherol and it starts to auto-oxidize or, you know, it starts to act as, as a oxidant in cell instead of acting, acting like an ox, antioxidant. Well, to act as an oxidant, it first needs to be, get converted to something called the, the hyd- uh, a hydroquinone. Okay. So the tocopherol, if you look at the molecule, basically, some of those hydroxyl groups, uh, one of them can become an actual carbonyl group. And that's basically when, it, when it's like a semi-quinone. And a semi-quinone can, can have pro-oxidant effects. 
but I don't think these effects o- uh, overwhelm or I know I've never seen cases where providing like a vitamin E as a supplement has ever had a pro ROS effect, right? So prooxin effect is not necessarily bad, right? In fact, you want it because a hydroquinone can accept one electron, right? Uh, we already know the quinones are beneficial. They can accept, most of them can accept two electrons, right? So hydroquinone is not necessarily bad. It's maybe only in a situation where a hydroquinone is in the direct proximity of one of those fatty acid radicals. Maybe it can convert into something even more toxic, but we would have seen it by now in large experimental studies. Um, I don't know of a large experimental study, in other words, where there was intervention with uh, vitamin E that actually produced a pro-ROS effect and somehow worsened biomarkers uh, such as the T-bars, right, which measures the thiobarbituric acid um, reactive species, um, which basically is a is a test which measures effectively the levels of malondialdehyde in the body because it's it's malondialdehyde is reacted with thiobarbituric acid and if you know if sufficient malondialdehyde is present then you get this byproduct and then can you know quantify it and say hey you have a lot of malondialdehyde in the body all the studies that I've seen so far with tocopherol uh, any of the isoforms uh, has produced a reduction in T bars slash NDA not an increase um, so if if there are peroxidant effects. Um, and by peroxin, I mean like somehow causing oxidative damage. Uh, I would say they're probably localized um, and they're only present uh, um, in organisms that are saturated. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that it was, that are filled up with even more highly unsaturated fats, probably the omega-3s. So I can see kind of a problem with a person who is consuming a lot of fish oil and also taking a lot of vitamin E. However, even that does not seem to be the case because there's a uh, used to be a very... Um, a widespread disease called yellow fat disease. Uh, to this day, it's, it's still acknowledged as existing, but but people say it's the medicine says it only exists in animals, especially in cats. So if you feed cats only fish food, eventually, without any supplementation, they develop yellow fat disease, which is basically the reason it's called yellow fat is because of this accumulated uh, poof of peroxidation byproducts in their brains and their retinas. So to me, that's yet another uh, 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 argument against the fact that omega-3 are beneficial for vision or brain is because if you don't consume enough vitamin E, you will develop yellow fat disease. People who who used to work on fish trawlers will like will, will very commonly develop that. Uh, and then the industry realized that and they started feeding them food that was supplementing with vitamin E. But anyways, they, they basically became deranged. They developed dementias. They became psychotic, aggressive, etc. And if, in their latest forms of the disease before they die, they actually, they actually became semi-blind. So if anything, an excess of omega-3 is more likely to harm your uh, your retina and your brain uh, instead of help it. So for me, considering that we have no evidence that it's actually needed, I would actually stay away from it. Uh, multiple studies have come out said that despite the fact that about 30% of the of, of babies that are exclusively breastfed are actually developing EFA deficiency, and despite that fact, these babies grow to be much healthier, much more resilient, and much smarter than their formula fed or omega-3 supplemented brethren or sisters, uh, to me speaks enough that we don't need to mess by adding more omega-3 than, it, than is already present in breast milk. I also think it's kind of ironic that omega-3s are like exponentially more unstable than omega-6s, which are exponentially more unstable than omega-9s, and then obviously saturated fats. But it's like omega-3s are theoretically worse than omega-6s, right? Because they're so much more likely to undergo lipid peroxidation. I mean, there's, there's, there's all of these positions where basically a, 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 one of the reactive ultra species can attack. Mm-hmm. So if you have two times more, uh, I mean, in fact, they're so susceptible to lipid peroxidation that most of the fish oil products that you're getting on the market, unless they have some vitamin E added to them, they already smell rancid. Yep. Uh, and it was turned out to be one of the biggest problems in clinical trials. And this is why, I don't know if you've seen the, um, the commercials for the uh, uh, for the pharma drug based on omega-3 called Lavaza or Lovaza, I think it's called, L-O-V-A-Z-A. It's basically esters of omega-3s because they're slightly more resistant to peroxidation. The company running the clinical trials with Lovatsa actually initially started with regular uh, unesterified omega-3s and found out that a a large portion of of the trial recruitments dropped out they were developing nausea, diarrhea. They said we smell, uh, we get fish breath all the time. Our bodies start reeking of fish. We don't like this, right? So they created these esters. They're actually the ethyl esters of DHA and EPA. Uh, and it got approved by the FDA as a drug for lowering triglycerides. 
Um, but even then, basically, uh, even those fatty acid esters, if you look at their instructions, they're instructing you to consume your, basically, your uh, uh, prescription, monthly prescription within that month. And if you skip a month, in other words, if you have something left over that's like two months or older, they say you should discard it. Uh, so it's it's already known that these the, that these lipids are highly highly uh, peroxidizable, um, and again the only argument we have for their for their benefit, uh, c- considering that all of the randomized placebo controlled trials with adults and young adults and even children at, uh, so far have failed with both omega three and omega six. The only thing we have left as an argument, quote unquote, for feeding into babies is that. Uh, they've been shown to accumulate, you know, in higher amounts in babies in the retina and the brain, right? But then the presence of yellow fat disease and the fact that breastfed babies, even if EFA deficients are much healthier and much smarter and better vision, and even actually they live longer. Uh, to me, is an argument that, uh, you know, there is no argument that we should be supplementing omega-3. Um, I, we're still waiting on an argument, for, you know, uh, an actual uh, sufficient, uh, st- sufficient strong argument that giving them is bad, right? But the argument so far that, that they're good is not there. Yeah. There's, there's no evidence for that. What do you think of the tocotrienols? I think the fact that they're unsaturated uh, may present some problems. Um, I've seen studies with mice, rats, cats, and rabbits um, and in I think two of those uh, studies that I saw, they noticed liver enlargement, which is usually a sign of estrogenicity. Now, whether this, that was due to the tocotrienols or the formulation that they were given in, that's, you know, the, uh, they didn't say, they said they were dissolved in oil. Yeah, but what oil, right? So maybe if you give them dissolved in PUFA, the effect is much more pronounced negatively than if you just give the tocotrienols themselves. I tried the... Um, uh, Unique E, the the company used to have a tocotrienol product a long time ago. I don't know if you still if they still have it. I don't think so. I tried it. Um, I kind of liked it to be honest with you. I didn't have bad reactions to it. Um, it kind of improved my mood. Um, but you know, I I didn't feel that much of a difference between their Unique T product at the time that was the the, the mixed tocopherols, right, and the tocotrienols. And then over time, their Unique E product, the toco- tocopherols, they seem to start getting like very uh, like a lighter in color. Uh, and more liquidy, so I thought they were maybe adding some oil. Anyways, that was my experimentation back in circa 2014, 2015. So my personal experience with the tocotrienols was not bad, but the studies suggest there may be some estrogenicity, uh, especially if combined with uh, with PUFA. I have a two-parter. So whenever it comes to vitamin E, at what point can you overdo it? And then whenever it comes to antioxidants in general, um, can you become or can you get into an overly reductive state? I don't think you can do that with vitamin E. With vitamin D, e, the problem is that it's actually more of a structural antioxidant, uh, where basically the uh, uh, you know the the problem with the uh, other antioxidants, such as NAC, right, which is also heavily promoted, um, or glutathione, the reduced portion, GSH, um, those actually can put you in a reductive state. While the tocopherols, the presence of tocopherols, because it's such a is is sort of like a lipidy molecule. And if it, it accumulates uh, actually in the uh, same area where the lipids are in the cell, so it's protecting them physically from the attack of the actual um, of the actual reactive oxygen species. While the other, the true reductants, are actually donating electrons, and they, they can actually put you in a truly reductive state because usually the the acceptance of that electron is NAD. So you're going to get a defi- sort of like a relative deficiency of NAD, which will drop the NAD to the NADH ratio. The problem with uh, heavy supplementation with the coffrol, aside from the fact that it tends to irritate the GI tract, especially if you don't take it mixed with some kind of a fat, if it's just the pure tocopherols, they're extremely viscous and they tend to stick to uh, like a, sort of like the mucosal areas. So if you rub some on your gums, undiluted and or on your lips, you'll see that they'll stay there for the entire day, no matter how much you lick it or like you eat food and whatnot, or you drink water. So unless you're eating some fatty meal, they can actually dissolve it and get it away from the on that surface, you'll, you'll, you'll stay stuck there. And over time, even you, you can feel it even in your gums, because I've tried this effect, because uh, um, Dr. Peter has mentioned several people not reacting well to vitamin that it may be irritating their gut. I've tried this in my mouth, and if you actually leave it there for a few hours, you start getting itchy, which is usually a you know a, an indication of a histamine release and or serotonin, and it's not a good sign. So, the, so very large doses can cause intestinal irritation. Uh, but even even be, before you reach that point, anything beyond, I would say, two grams daily, which is a massive dosage, anything beyond two grams daily, uh, you basically, because of the inhibition of the cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase enzymes, you basically have a platelet, anti-platelet aggregating effect. Uh, 
So you, you'll be very prone to bleeding. Um, so in, in fact, in my experience, vitamin E uh, has higher risk of causing bleeding issues than aspirin does, even aspirin in very high doses. In fact, the risk with aspirin is somewhat paradoxical. They seem to be much higher with lower dosages up to a tablet a day, especially the baby aspirin. And once you cross the threshold of, uh, let's say like two, three tablets a day and higher, then the majority of the effects of aspirin are metabolic. They're not really uh, hemostatic. Uh, well, with tocopherol, actually, if you if you take it in sufficiently high doses, usually above two grams, uh, you basically get into a point where you may be prone to bleeding. Uh, and this means it's increasing your requirements for vitamin K. Uh, and some studies have demonstrated that because vitamin E and K apparently depend on the same protein produced by the liver for transport to peripheral tissues, if you're taking too much vitamin E continuously, uh, you may be preventing uh, not so much the absorption of vitamin K from the diet, but, but it's actual transport to peripheral tissue. So you may accumulate it in the liver and who knows what the liver will do with excess vitamin K. Maybe it will excrete it, you know, or maybe at some point it will accumulate to the point where it becomes toxic. It's not known. But what it is known is that if you give sufficiently high dosages to animals, which are equivalent to human doses in the excess of two and a half grams daily, after a month, you will develop uh, vitamin K deficiency in peripheral tissues. Uh, so that's really like the, the 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 main issue that I see with it. Is that why Ray doesn't like supplementing K and E at the same time? Uh, well, they, well, they also react, okay. right? Basically, I mean, the basic K and E react, and the the E conver converts into the hydroquinone that I mentioned, and the hydroquinone is actually highly susceptible to interaction um, to basically uh, 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 interaction under UV light. Uh, so, you, so you can create phototoxicity. So that's the thing. That's where the, the pro-oxidant, in a bad sense, effect from vitamin E is coming from. If you take K and E so that the E is converted into the hydro in the semi-quinone, under the effects of ultraviolet light and potentially molecular oxygen, you're getting basically a phototoxicity reaction. Uh, but it's still it's still dependent on PUFA. Uh, without PUFA, there'll be very little uh, for the basically the ultraviolet light to damage there or activate a molecule to cause damage. And Ray has also talked about vitamin C acting as a structural antioxidant, correct? Where it's not in like the ascorbic acid form, it's in the ascorbate form, which is more like fat soluble. So it's just sitting there kind of like the vitamin E. The, uh, the, the ascorbic acid is in the reduced form, right? So when you take it, it's actually reductant. Um, but once in the body, it gets oxidized to dehydroascorbic acid. That's the portion that basically has a, okay. a structural antioxidant effect and also is vital for, for the function of the adrenal glands. Uh, the regular ascorbic acid is not. Uh, so it needs to get converted into the hydroascorbic acid. But in order for that to happen, you have good oxidative, you need good, good oxidative metabolism. And if you don't, you, you may be basically impeding steroidogenesis, not just in the adrenal, but also in the gonads because vitamin C seems to accumulate most in the in the adrenals and the, and the gonads, the testicles in males and the ovaries in females. And it's only capable of assisting there when it's in the in its oxidized form called dehydroscorbic acid. Okay, interesting. But in order for it to get converted, one electron needs to get a, get removed. And for that, you need NAD because that's really the acceptor. Other other methods are, and is, in fact, there is a chemical, uh, there's actually a pharma drug on the market that's using this uh, remarkable pro-health structural antioxidant effect of dehydroscorbic acid. So they're administering the reduced version, uh, ascorbic acid, which is very cheap, right? They're administering together with a quinone which will oxidize it once oh. in the body. That, that quinone is vitamin K3, which is the, almost the same as vitamin K2, just a shorter aliphatic chain, so it's less lipophilic, but it's still the same quinone effects. And basically what, what happens is, you know, and that drug is called Apatone, and it was shown to stop terminal prostate cancer that was basically, uh, people were told there's nothing that we can do to, for you that's metastatic, right? Uh, go home and die, basically. And so Apatone was able to stop that. And now Apatone is in clinical trials, which is nothing but a combination of five grams vitamin C and 50 milligrams of vitamin K3. That is all there is. And it's administered by an injection. Uh, that drug is now in clinical trials for ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and I believe lung cancer. Um, and the trials are still ongoing. I think I think it has, it has a, a, a lot of promise. But if nothing else, should be a great indication that the, the metabolic therapy works for cancer. Uh, and it, f now we have at least one drug that's already approved for such use. I was curious as to what your personal protocol is whenever you go out and are exposed to PUFA. Oh, vitamin E, without a doubt. Um, and also, 
orange juice seems to help a lot because it has uh, the flavonoids inside, specifically flava, flavones and flavanones. The flavones, uh, uh, the one that is, that is present in uh, orange juice, I think is apigenin, and the flavanone that is in orange juice and also grapefruit juice is naringenin. Uh, both of these are good, uh, and they actually they're capable of acting uh, as redox molecules. In other words, they're capable of accepting electrons and then donating them. But when you ingest them from orange juice, they're in their oxidized form, which means they're similar to actually ingesting uh, vitamin K. Uh, and they have the, the redox, the redox potential is the same. They can accept two electrons and then they can donate two electrons. Um, so I, I would take vitamin E um, either a little bit before the meal or like with it or a little bit after. The good thing about vitamin E is that you don't have to take it every day. Its half-life is 48 to 60 hours, which means that if you take it two or three times a week only, uh, that's probably enough. And be, uh, several studies have actually shown that you can, um, you know, get away with taking it only once a week. Uh, because it accumulates in the liver and the liver seems to be releasing it into the bloodstream uh, in correlation with the amount of PUFA, whether from the diet or being released by from the tissues by, by lipolysis. So to me, that's probably the cheapest and you know most uh, widely available method. If that is not available, if you can get access to good orange juice, even if it's from concentrate, I would drink a glass of that daily um, and that should probably be okay because the flavones and flavonones accumulate in tissues similar to the tocopherols. They're, they're lipophilic molecules uh, and they can stay in your tissues for a very long time. Uh, some studies have shown that the half-life of the already accumulated flavones and flavonones in the, in the fatty tissues because that's where they prefer to accumulate, which is nice because they protect the PUFA there, right? It's the same as the PUFA, which is the half-life is two years. So I have a question that I've thought about why is there any reason or like could you just use coconut oil topically or any sort of saturated fat to help saturate your fat stores uh, i know that obviously the absorption is not going to be significant but you could if you can absorb fat soluble vitamins through skin which we do know i don't see why you couldn't absorb you know saturated fatty acids as well and help to saturate your fat stores over time that's perfectly feasible in fact it's a very common practice in southeast asian countries the Indians do it with ghee and with coconut oil, which tends to be more expensive, but ghee. And then the Southeast Asian cultures, especially Vietnam, Thailand, Burma, the Philippines, they use coconut oil. Uh, and basically, um, it, women use it for hair treatment as well, for scalp treatment. If you have like seborrheic dermatitis um, or any kind of like a, you know, age spot pigmentation, it, it they know it's very good, which, which shows you that it dissolves lipofuscin at least when it's uh, on the surface, right, or close to the surface. So I think it's a very good method. Uh, I just, you know, it, it will require, you know, a significant amount to uh, to rub it, you know, uh, along your entire body. But maybe you can just concentrate on the midsection because that's really where the dangerous fat is. It's the central obesity that is correlated with virtually all of the chronic diseases, not, not basically big amounts of subcutaneous fat. If anything, the subcutaneous fat is what makes people look younger because it keeps the skin non-wrinkly. Uh, so if you can rub it on your abdomen and your chest and maybe your shoulders, uh, really areas where you think like you're carrying extra fat, since most of the fat is PUFO because PUFO preferentially absor uh, absor uh, is stored in the fatty tissues, right? Uh, then you can probably change the composition over time. There are already studies showing that, that this can be done. Um, now, for how long before you reach a, a EFA deficiency, um, that hasn't been tested. But uh, assuming you, you absorb around let's say 10 to 15 percent of the of the applied amount right in order to cover an area of your you know of your abdomen um, basically you'll probably need probably two ounces I'd say um, if you really want to rub this area well uh, I mean that's what's that 60 about 60 grams 10 percent is six grams that's a significant amount of saturated fat uh, basically being absorbed uh, in your peripheral tissues. Um, so if you do it, or, or you know, day on a daily basis, or like almost every day, it's probably it's pr you're probably you're looking at at basically uh, the saturated fat out competing or outnumbering the PUFA in your body after a few months. Couldn't you also get fat in that regard though from doing that or nah? No, they're they're easily oxidized through the beta oxidation process, okay. and they're because they don't need transport into the mitochondria. At least the medium and the short chain fatty acids. They basically, it's like you're you're rubbing glucose in your body. They'll get they'll get converted to energy very quickly. So if you guys see me in the future just lubed up, it's because Georgie said so. <laughs> I'm gonna be a grease ball. <laughs> All I said is try it out. <laughs> <laughs> so is that why, um, like calories that you put on your skin don't necessarily correlate to your overall caloric intake? 
Yeah, yeah. Most of what you put on your skin is going to get metabolized before it even reaches the bloodstream, especially if it's like uh, something like fat. Um, and in fact, with the steroids, uh, they found out that you can because the, there's this topic. Obviously, we're interested in topical absorption of various chemicals, including steroids, such as pregnenolone, progesterone, DHEA. Uh, some recent studies have suggested that when you apply the steroids to the skin. It's not that they don't absorb. It's not the absorption that's the problem, but the fact that the skin, because it's the largest steroidogenic and steroid processing organ in your body, um, and it's actually the largest organ in your body, um, it, it metabolizes most of what you apply into other, basically, like uh, steroids that are or like other molecules. So if you apply pregnenolone, um, studies have shown that, that basically you do not detect any changes um, in, the, uh, in, in blood levels of pregnenolone. But uh, and, and they thought that's because it doesn't absorb very well. That's not true. It actually absorbs remarkably well because it's a lipid. It's just that the skin likes it so much. And not as the recent studies show that the skin, the, the cells all over the body accumulate pregnenolone inside of themselves at a ratio of a, more than 100 to 1 to what's in the bloodstream. So assuming that the, you know, the, the cells of most people are relatively deficient in pregnenolone or any other, like of the good steroids, you know, you have to apply a significant amount before they've had enough and they allow some of it to go to the bloodstream. Uh, probably similar thing with the saturated fats. Because the cells like them so much, um, uh, if nothing else but for energy production, I mean, a significant amount of what you apply basically will get, uh, you know, most of it will probably get absorbed, but not, mo uh, you know, a small portion will end up in a bloodstream simply because passing through all these cells before they reach the capillaries, uh, basically the cells will, like, eat that fat up and, and turn it into energy. It's crazy. Um, so you think, I know coconut oil is an SPF of like two technically, but you think all the saturated fats would kind of be a good sunscreen in that, at least to protect the... Everything that can protect. Vitamin E is a great as a skin protector, especially if mixed. But I, you don't need to put much since there's also the potential skin irritating effect. So maybe like a 10 to 1 ratio of coconut oil with vitamin E or like even olive oil and vitamin E, uh, you'll be great. And in fact, it's a very common recipe in Mediterranean countries. Either just apply only pure coconut oil, which has some... Um, antioxidants such as hydroxytyrosol, which is a derivative of the amino acid tyrosine, and acts in a manner similar to vitamin E. But cocoa, uh, olive oil also has its vitamin E content too. And it's not that much lower than things like wheat germ oil or corn oil or soybean oil, which are, you know, they've been used commercially for extracting most of the vitamin E on the market, but only because it's they're much so much more cheaper to produce, or at least they're much more mass produced than the olive oil. The olive oil has comparable amounts of vitamin E, but because you know, if you produce olive oil, it itself fetch, fetches a good price. Um, you know, you can't really afford to extract vitamin E from it because that means essentially wasting on vitamin. So that vitamin E will be astronomically expensive if you end up extracting it from there. Anyways, long story short, vitamin, uh, sorry, uh, uh, olive oil is, uh, you know, a sort of like a very common and widespread remedy um, uh, in the Mediterranean, both the European and the Northern African part for basically skin treatment, uh, for slimming down, uh, for preventing sunburn or at least like getting this nice tan without the redness and itchiness and peeling skin. Um, so, yeah. So, um, so any kind of other fat that does, does not smell very bad. By the way, lanolin, which is made from sheep wool, right? It's the grease that the, the sheep skin cells excrete to protect the wool. Um, that's actually really, really good. It probably, probably uh, beats anything else, including vitamin E, as an antioxidant skin protector. Unfortunately, it has a, a really, really strong sheep smell. But you can buy deodorated lanolin. If you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, not many companies sell it, but the ones they do, if you get like a bucket, it's really nice. It's basically like you're spreading wax on your skin. It has no smell. Uh, it's really, it's really nice and 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 you know, um, silky and smooth, uh, but it absorbs very quickly, right? So your skin doesn't feel greasy after that. It actually, and some people are actually using lanolin as a transdermal enhancer, uh, but it's in my experience the only the only form that will be tolerated is the one that's deodorized. Uh, everything else smells horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty crazy. So our good friend, Jake Miner, a coworker, asked why higher testosterone helps balance blood sugar. And I want to know if this happens in a, or he also asked if this happens in a dose dependent manner. Um, I thought it was part, probably because of the nutrient partitioning effects, sending more glucose and amino acids to the muscle cells. But what do you think? 
that that is certainly a part of it but i think the biggest part because the effect is very rapid if you if you basically inject a sufficiently high amount of testosterone or of a fast acting form of it such as the base right or, or like a short chain ester such as the acetate uh, you can cause hypoglycemia and if 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 that rapid effect tells you that there is an endocrine uh, effect there and that endocrine effect has to do with cortisol um testosterone is most other androgens uh basically it's anabolic effects uh, are actually mostly anti-catabolic. There's there are old studies that I posted on the Rapid Forum that show that all of the uh, so-called anabolic steroids discovered so far, uh, uh, basically they they owe the vast majority of their effects to the fact that they're cortisol blockers, because the muscle growth is mostly restrained by the presence of cortisol. You remove cortisol altogether, such as by removing the adrenals. And then rats turn into a, a ridiculously muscular animals that don't look look any, anything like rodents. So the getting taking anabolic st- steroids effectively mimics that state of you know suppressing the adrenals or at least blocking the effects of excess cortisol. Um, so anything that lowers cortisol or blocks its effects will drop blood sugar. Uh, and in fact, the cortisol blocker, which is a, uh, popularly known as the abortion pill, um, mifepristone, also known as RU486. Uh, is now actually being being trialed for diabetes type 2, both for the obesity portion of it and the insulin resistance, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, and also it's it's been used for years for the treatment of the hyperglycemia seen in people with Cushing disease, which is the people with uh, excessive production of cortisol. So my Vepristone was uh, drug designed as a cortisol blocker, but it was designed in the 80s. And at the time, basically the marketing people in the pharma company said, we don't want to make much money if we sell it as a cortisol blocker, but we also found that it blocks the progesterone receptor, which means it causes abortion. So it's a huge market for it. Let's let's sell it as the abortion pill. But don't forget, it was actually designed as a cortisol blocker. Anyways, story is anything that blocks cortisol or helps with cortisol disposal, um, such as, let's say, things that uh, either inhibit 11-beta-HSD1, which synthesizes cortisol, or increase 11 beta hsd 2 which deactivates cortisol, we are going to have hypoglycemic effects. Emodin, which is uh, a quinone, another quinone, found in cascara mostly, but many other herbs as well, uh, is a powerful inhibitor of HSB1 and is being trialed. I mean, multiple animal studies demonstrated that it uh, rapidly normalizes blood glucose, even in diabetic anim- animals, and now it's being trialed in humans. So if you're seeing basically a, you know, a, a blood sugar normalizing effect of something, and if it's rapid, right, if it doesn't take several days to, for this to happen, my first guess is that it's somehow acting in a manner opposite to cortisol or serotonin, which is another chemical which promotes cortisol by itself, but it, it can also have hyperglycemic effect. So on top of these endocrine effects, do you think that one of the differences between DHT and testosterone and the androgenic effects of DHT compared to testosterone is because it's nutrient partitioning to other cells, like more like hair and... Um, you know, facial cells, I guess. Yep. And also it's a much more powerful stimulant of both DNA and RNA synthesis and also muscle protein synthesis. The The reason DHT hasn't seen that much usage as testosterone, first of all, it has bad reputation, right? It's basically like causing hair loss and causing prostate cancer. Uh, the first one may be still debatable. The second one is already not. We already have multiple trials showing that with humans, showing that injection of testosterone into the prostate actually stops terminal prostate cancer. And the prostate expresses, of all the enzymes, it expresses the most 5-alpha reductase. So when injected with testosterone, it's going to convert 90 plus percent of it into dihydrotestosterone, DHT, right? So any argument that androgens are bad for the prostate flies out of the window. And if that was not enough, the uh, there's a DHT cream on the market called Andractin. In Europe, it is a officially approved drug for treating prostate enlargement. So how can you know a part of the world use DHT to treat prostate issues? The other <laughs> part of the world says, nope, <laughs> this is the villain. We're going to give you finasteride or Unreal. some other drugs that are blocking it. Yeah, a little. But anyways, uh, the, so it looks like the anabolic effect is about 80% opposition to cortisol, right? The hypertrophic effect. And the other 20% is stimulation of basically DNA and RNA synthesis and potentially increasing the expression of various steroidogenic enzymes. So you end up producing even more steroids. I think DHT as a much stronger androgen than, than testosterone excels at the latter, right? But as like testosterone, it has a similar affinity to testosterone for a cortisol receptor. So most people have been taking like a hundred, bodybuilders usually eject on average about a hundred milligrams testosterone daily, right? I don't know of anybody who's ever tried injecting 
100 milligrams dihydrotestosterone daily. So, so the comparisons that I've seen so far between the testosterone are in, unfair because nobody is using them in a sort of like a comparable dosage when it comes to the glucocorticoid receptor. My, my guess is that if somebody was using as high of a dosage of DHT as they were using T, they would see an even bigger effect because their effects against cortisol are similar, if not the same. But DHT is a stronger estrogen antagonist and also stronger stimulant of overall protein synthesis and um, the, the, synthesis, the the renovation of the cellular machinery. So the cell will be able to basically like divide more in a controlled manner and create more tissue. Um, that that would be my, my my take on it. So I said a, uh, kind of one big question from the t- conversation with Tucker. And uh, he said, you have to consume less fat than you eat um, in order to, to lose fat because all fats are stored. Um, then he also said, um, he seemed to allude to most carbs are also stored, which I thought, I thought the, it was interesting that he said most fats are stored. And I've been thinking about that. I don't know if I agree with that. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. But I also thought he, I comp- kind of completely disagreed with the carbs are all stored. And then he also said poop are prefer- preferentially stored or oxidized. Then he said he sent you some papers that said they were oxidized. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts generally on that. He hasn't sent me that. I mean, I, I don't want this to necessarily accuse him of anything. Yeah. Maybe he just forgot. But the studies that I have seen show that in they, they actually fed people and animals deuterated sugars so they can actually see how much of the dosage that was fed ended up in lipids. Uh, and basically, you have to feed a human in excess of one pound of sugar daily before you actually see some, you know, notable synthesis of palmitic acid, right, which is what gets synthesized through the fatty acid synthase pathway. Um, and even that, actually, because it's palmitic, because it's saturated, it will probably get get oxidized before it even makes it to the tissues. Now, when you're eating the fats, the, the studies that I have seen and that I have shown, actually, I've posted them on the forum and my blog, show that the saturated fats are preferentially oxidized. The liver loves them. Uh, and maybe that's one reason why there are some studies showing that you can give, you can take alcoholics, cirrhotic alcoholics, that the liver is almost, you know, about to fail completely. And you start feeding them saturated fats such as butter or coconut oil. And not only they can, basically their, 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 their fibrosis of the liver fully disappears in the presence of continued alcohol abuse. So you turn them into happy, healthy alcoholics by feeding them saturated fat. And the effect is mostly due to the saturated fat blocking the effects of PUFA on the liver and, and potentially endotoxin as well. So it shows you the liver disease is actually a PUFA peroxidation or a direct PUFA problem. Uh, and get, giving saturated fat, it cures it. The, the only way for the saturated fat to have this effect is to actually stay there in the liver, right? So the liver actually has a, a tremendous capacity for utilizing and, and even storing saturated fats. Uh, it doesn't seem to like the polyunsaturated fats, and that may be one reason why when you actually measure a urine output and start looking for the fatty acids there, right, the ones that are glucuronidated are primarily PUFA, um, and the ones that are free fatty acids are actually primarily saturated fatty acids. Um, to me, that's an argument that the liver does not like the polyunsaturated fats and does its best to actually excrete them, while the PUFAs are basically either esterified um, or released in a free form beyond what the liver can consume. And the liver can consume, can actually utilize a, a very large amount of fats on a daily basis. So do you think that you do need to cons- saturate a PUFA no matter, you still need to consume less fat than you're burning in order to lose fat? So basically at, at rest, your muscles are burning mostly fat. Um, so the amount of basically lean muscle tissue or, or lean, lean mu- muscle mass or lean mass or the amount of fat tissue, conversely, right? So you, you would want to be at a fat percentage below 15% body fat. Uh, if that's the case, then you can probably get away without actually modifying diet uh, much beyond avoiding the PUFA and exercising at all. Now, if you have a higher amount of fat, I think it, it basically it, it, it's, it will be beneficial to cut down on the intake of fat, but I will still consume the carbs because I'm convinced beyond any reason about that, at least for myself, that if you lower the fat and lower the carbs as well, right? So you eat this high protein, what, what did he call it? Muscle tissue sparing, high protein diet? Yeah, some, I think it's um, the term was, yeah, yeah, something like that. It wasn't, it, it was like some fancy name with like, I'll, I'll have to think, I'll think on it, but. But it was high protein yeah. diet at the expense of the other two macronutrients. So, so he's saying you have to, you have to lower the amount of fat in the diet, which I agree with. He's saying you also have to lower the amount of sugar because it's going to keep lipolysis down and you don't want that, right? And then you basically eat a lot of calories as protein. To me, that that diet is not optimal. Multiple studies have shown that you can actually fry your kidneys if you eat a sufficiently high protein diet. 
Um, and basically, if you're, yes, if you're eating carbs, it's going to keep lipolysis down, but this is actually, you want it. It will not block it fully. There is always some baseline lipolysis. And basically, if the liver is functioning, that baseline lipolysis will be, uh, the liver will be able to handle it. So these, these free fatty acids will pass through the liver and the liver, because it does not like the PUFA, it will tend to glucuronidate it, make it more water soluble, and you should be able to pee it up. And some of that gets excreted with the stool as well. Uh, because there's, there's, there's this continuous circulation between the liver, um, the, the gallbladder, and the gastrointestinal tract, right? Um, so, so I would not want to increase lipolysis more by basically eating a low-carb diet and even more so by exercising. Because I think that was his argument, right? You go on the low-carb, low-fat, high-protein diet, you're already talking basically elevated lipolysis because you're not consuming sufficient carbs. And on top of that, you, you want to burn more fat by providing more fat by, by elevating lipolysis. Now, the body has a capacity for oxidizing fat. Uh, and several studies have shown that uh, when you go on long distance runs, even if they're not very intensive, basically beyond the 10 mile mark, you're getting into a situation of liver failure. There's a study that I posted on the forum maybe four years ago showing that a majority of marathon runners uh, get to the finish line in a state of basically acute kidney failure. Um, and most of them recover, right? But would you want, does that sound sound like something, some, some, like something positive that you want to do on a daily basis? Now, I'm not saying... Uh, you, you, you will always give yourself kidney failure, right, if you're lowering the carbs. But if you're lowering the carbs and you're also increasing the exercise, I think you're increasing lipolysis to a point where the organs will get overwhelmed with that fat. And of course, since that fat is mostly PUFA, the lipid peroxidation uh, will start. Uh, and in fact, they even have like these protocols for animal studies where they actually measure the T-bars. Uh, uh, they use the T-bars assay to actually measure at what point they're stressing the animals with exercise too much. Um, and they, they've calculated, uh, th the thing for rats was that it's basically an hour of running on their wheels, like a day, right? No, anything more than that, the T-bars rises and basically like all of these toxic byproducts start to appear as well. That would be a good indication that you'll probably start to damage organs, peripheral organs. And the most susceptible ones to the elevated lipolysis, which is mostly PUFA, are the kidney, the kidneys, the liver, and the brain. And that's like one of the main benefits of having more muscle mass, right? It's just that you burn more fat at rest. So that's going to take away some of the fat in the bloodstream, which is going to decrease the Randall cycle so that the organs and everything else can increase more yep, carb. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. So Ella, try to do whatever's possible to increase lean muscle mass, right? Uh, and you keep your organs as healthy as possible. Elevated lipolysis will not do the latter, right? Um, so basically concentric uh, exercises such as actually lifting weights is, is a mix, is a concentric and eccentric uh, but things like climbing stairs um, or like rowing um, Sprinting, or like jumps, even biking right? or swimming. Yes, exactly. Jumps, things like that. Those are almost purely concentric exercises. And uh, it's been shown that your muscles can actually act uh, almost identical to your gonads and produce much more testosterone than your gonads produce when you stimulate the muscles with concentric exercise. So it's going to produce testosterone locally which is going to have to lead to that basically anti-cortisol hypertrophic effect on muscles. You're going to have more muscles. You're going to burn more fat at rest, right? Or at least with mild exercise. You don't you don't want to get to a point where you basically, you can actually tell it by the smell. You start smelling like glycerol. Uh, and I think that actually they sell, uh, they sell, you can get like the ketone strips, right? But they're only good for, for full-blown ketosis for people that are against diabetic or practicing the, the low-carb diet for a long time. But they also have these devices they're these breathalyzer devices when they can tell you when you're basically like exhaling too much glycerol. And that is a byproduct of, of fatty acid oxidation, right? Because they the, the fatty acids exist in the form, storage form are straight glycerides. So when they start getting broken down for oxidation or any other purpose, the glycerol will basically like start floating around. It also gets metabolized. But accumulation of glycerol, rising of glycerol in the blood is an indication of excessive lipolysis. And you can feel it on your breath if you get trained enough. Um, so, you know, if you get to that point, if you learn how to like sense yourself when you're starting to become glycerolic or you smell like glycerol, you've overdone it. You don't want to get to that. So what are your thoughts on acute lactate? So like from exercise increasing just like the thought processes. And I think they've shown it in rats that the lactate goes to the latex cells and the testes, which increases testosterone synthesis is there, which then in turn has a nutrient partitioning effect. And potentially, I guess you said as well, the exercising causing the testosterone increase in the cells as well. But so do you think that acute lactate can have a beneficial effect in the short term? 
Well, it, it, if you are like, I mean, it's preferential to fatty acids uh, because the fatty acids are, are basically slow fuel. And multiple studies have shown that basically people on a low carb diet and in general uh, diet that induces ketosis, they have a drastically lower levels of testosterone. So we know that fatty acid burning, predominantly fatty acid burning, is not good for the for the testosterone production. Now, lactate, uh, my personal take on it is that, it, by the way, it can very easily get converted back to pyruvate if you have sufficient amounts of NAD. So uh, I haven't seen the studies that have shown directly that it's the lactate that's stimulating the synthesis of, of, the, of testosterone. If these cells are in a well-nourished environment with sufficient amounts of oxidized cofactors such as NAD, and they usually put NAD only because they know NAD can easily get reduced. They don't do NADH. Um, so these medians contain a sufficient amount of NAD to actually convert the lactate back to pyruvate, right? And then that pyruvate may be going through the Krebs cycle of these cell cultures that they're testing um, and, you know, uh, serving as, as fuel uh, to actually, or similar, like, similar to glucose, to stimulate testosterone synthesis. Uh, another possible uh, role could be is that it's been shown that the last step of the synthesis of testosterone, which is the 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, uh, it depends on the reducing cofactor, which is NADH or NADPH. Lactate being a reductant may be able to help in that last in that last step and generate these required cofactors specifically for that enzyme. Uh, re- uh, I mean, in the, in, in the place where it's located, and that could speed up the, the last step of synthesis. Now, I am uh, I would be curious to see what are the effects of lactate on the other steps of the steroidogenesis. Suppose it increased it increased the of testosterone, but inhibited the let's say the conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone. That would not be a good result, right? Uh, or inhibited any of the other downstream uh, steps, the three beta HSD one, the seventeen twenty one lyase. Um, you know, uh, uh, on the path to testosterone. And one thing that is certain is that lactate actually activates aromatase. So even though it may have stimulated testosterone synthesis, if a good portion of it ends up as estrogen, I don't know what the net effect will be. Would it be positive, negative? It's hard to say. And so Tucker also said that 90% of fructose is converted to glucose in the digestive tract? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's in the digestive tract or in the cells because it, it the there's like a step, one step, in the glycolysis where basically fructose circumvents it, but after that, it gets converted into like an a intermediate of, gluco- of glucose metabolism and then gets oxidized the same for, for the rest of glycolysis. Um, I don't think the 90% number is, is accurate. There may be a study showing that, uh, but because we're seeing that basically when people consume, let's say high, cru- cru- high fructose corn syrup or sucrose, the levels of, of both fructose and glucose rise in the body, in the, in the blood proportionally, which tells me that if it was a 90% conversion into the gastrointestinal tract, then you should be seeing mostly glucose into the bloodstream, but that's not the case. We're seeing actually a significant amount of fructose into the bloodstream. Another thing is that most of the studies that used uh, the uh, the fructose feeding in order to demonstrate a fattening effect on the liver, when they measured the fructose levels into the liver, they found drastic increase again. They but if that was if there was a 90% conversion again, they should have seen actually mostly glucose end up in the liver and not fructose. Um, so I, I, you know, there may be one study showing that, but in my experience, the ones that I've seen, it's not the case. Do you think you can overconsume fructose and, and like, cause it's only metabolized in the liver pretty much, right? Maybe like one to 2% in the cells, but is it pretty much always going to be stored as glycogen or is the liver just going to be able to metabolize? I don't know. Uh, so for fructose, can you overconsume fructose or is the liver pretty much always going to be able to burn it, burn it or store it as glycogen, which I know it does preferentially. Is there going to be capacity for that? Or you think it's just so readily oxidized? Um, if you consume pure fructose, uh, there may be a portion where it basically starts get. I mean, it will, it will get. I, I don't think the liver consumes all of it. I don't think the the one or two percent peripheral number is accurate. I think it's more like 70, 30. Um, again, I mean, we're seeing a significant amount of fructose into the blood after a person consumes sucrose, right? Um, and the the reproductive organs they basically heavily depend on fructose. Um, the um, what is it called the uh, amniotic fluid is very high on fructose. Um, the base sperm is very high on fructose, the ovarian environment, the sticular environment, um, all of these cells there and the fluids that are there are very high on fructose. So a large amount of fructose is needed by peripheral tissues. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's not one or two. Uh, the brain is actually capable of metabolizing fructose. In fact, it's been shown that fructose injection directly into the brain increases the mitochondrial density of neurons. 
Um, so maybe the brain doesn't get as much as it wants to, right? But if you give it to the brain, the brain will certainly be able to metabolize it. Um, can you overconsume fructose? Well, again, it will depend on the, uh, we have to do some, some uh, uh, blood work, but the ones that I've seen from people where the fructose was consumed together with glucose, but in amounts really excessive, such as a kilo of basically sucrose daily, did not uh, increase the triglycerides beyond baseline. Uh, so, which means that you can consume at least a pound of fructose a day and not have a detrimental effect as far as the uh, blood lipid parameters are concerned. You may see some increase in cholesterol, uh, but it's only the oxidized cholesterol that is that is dangerous, and the oxidized cholesterol can only form if there is PUFA. No PUFA, no oxidation of cholesterol, and cholesterol, as we all know, is vital for the functioning of the body. And the fact that fructose increases LDL is not sufficient to say that, that fructose is, is detrimental. Awesome. Thank you. I just got one last question, unless Jaden has something. Um, olive oil, like, what do you think? It's, it's like, it, assuming we can get the non-rancid, like, good quality form with adequate vitamin E from, like, a good source, whatnot, and avocado oil, I'll throw in this as well. Do you think like we can consume it regularly? You really don't want like maybe kind of a intermittently, obviously not for high cooking as well, but, or do you really want to prioritize the saturated fats as much as possible? I, I would, well, uh, so, so here's the thing. If you had a choice between, you know, if you have to eat commercial food most of the time and you had a choice of, the, of, it, of it being made with uh, olive oil versus like any of the other commercials they're using, I would go with olive oil any day, right? Even if I have to consume any large amounts. It does have about, I think, 8 to 10% PUFA, right? But it's still nowhere near what you'll be consuming uh, if you eat the uh, commercial cooked foods, which is mostly canola oil, soybean oil, rapeseed oil, things like that. Cot even cottonseed oil, which is the worst, because it actually has a sterilizing agent in it called Gossypol, G-O-S-S-Y-P oil. If you look it up, you'll see that it was actually underdeveloped as a male sterilizing agent, as a male contraceptive pill. Um, anyway, so all of these oils that are being used for commercial food, of course, they're going to pick the cheapest ones, uh, and they're not going to be able to be less than optimal, so to speak. So preferable to that, definitely olive, olive oil. Is, and I would take the unrefined kind, because it's the unrefined kind that contains both the vitamin E and also some of the polycosinols, which are the very long-chain fatty acid alcohols, which have also shown very high, very good protective effects as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned. Uh, as far as whether it's uh, preferential to eat saturated fat, sure. So for maybe for cooking saturated fat, and then for things like salads um, or you know some meals that are colder, right? We actually need it like a fat will stay liquid at a, at a cooler temperature. Then you can eat. You, you can use like a spoon or two of olive oil. That would be my ideal. In fact, that's what I usually you know if I get a chance to cook something myself or like or get a chance to talk to the person cooking it. That's usually what I request. Cook with butter, ghee, or coconut oil. Um, um, the fully saturated coconut oil, in my opinion, is inconvenient. You have to wait for a very long time before it melts. Uh, but things like ghee and beef towel seem to work pretty well for, as cooking oils and butter. And then anything else that will be eaten at a cooler temperature, olive oil seems to work great, especially salads. Like where if you have to saute vegetables, right? Um, it's usually good. It's, it tastes very good to eat them with some. Uh, so the sauteing can be done. With uh, with beef tallow or butter, but if you know if somebody wants to add some more oil on top of it, because olive oil does seem to get uh, to to give like a extra taste, uh, extra texture of taste to like to things that are relatively blind in taste, such as cooked vegetables. Um, it it uh, the, that oil goes very well with vegetables for some reason um, it, it, when you eat them as like a salad as a side dish. While for cooking them, I think the uh, like the butter and the ghee and the beef towel will be preferable because of the animal aftertaste, like the grease, the animal grease gives it a good taste during cooking. But if you're eating as a side dish, olive oil seems to work, work better. Awesome. You have anything else? Yeah. Um, if you could speak to two people, anybody, one dead, one alive, who would they be? And what would you talk to them about? Dad would probably be Otto Warburg uh, because I think he had to figure it out what the cancer is 100% metabolic disease. For whatever reason, he didn't make that last push because he was a Nobel laureate. People would have listened, right? Um, and I think he wanted to do some studies with some pro-metabolic substances for cancer. To my knowledge, these all fell apart. Whether it's because of political influence or not, I don't know. That's what I would like to figure out. Um, but, you know, for me, at least it would, it would confirm that sort of like whatever progress we had in medicine and science largely aided in the 1940s and 50s. And everything since then is, is a dogma. Alive? I mean, um, I don't know. Well, oh, maybe uh, President Putin. 
uh, doesn't guarantee that he's going to tell me the truth, but I would, I would ask him, what's your end goal? Uh, and is it really America that you consider the enemy or the people in charge of America? And I don't mean the politicians that are in Congress, and I don't want to get it too much into conspiratorial stuff, but uh, uh, basically uh, there's th- many people have said Joe Biden is not in charge. It's other people pulling the strings. So my question would be, President Putin, are you fighting those people or do you just hate the Americans in general? I suspect the answer will be the former. I mean, I think he said it several times, but, uh, you know, uh, lately it's been a lot of propaganda that, you know, America is at war with Russia. It's basically us or them. Uh, the Russians hate us. We hate them. We're incompatible as people. I, I disagree, right? But, uh, you know, it would be interesting to ask him and see what he has to say, if he, if he would answer. <laughs> so I like to ask this question, um, you know, we're all kind of researchers independently and whatnot. Is there anything that's been like pondering around your head that you've just been thinking about, like some new argument your research you found that's just like been bouncing around in there? Um, I'm running some trials with animals, basically with vitamin B1 and B3 for cancer. And we found out, I found out, because it's my study, really, no, nobody else is uh, involved, um, basically that the vitamin B1 and B3 can stop the most lethal type of cancer they have. But it, the tumors did not disappear. Now, because of this metabolic therapy and the effects that it has, the known ones are mostly on the oxidation of carbs through pyruvate dehydrogenase and basically the lowering of lactate, right, and providing more NAD. Um, now, I'm going to repeat that study, but I'm going to add some more cofactors for pyruvate dehydrogenase, such as alpha lipoic acid and magnesium, and see if that improves the effects. And I'm going to replace the regular B1 uh, with one of the more fat-soluble analogs, such as allithiamine, benfotiamine, uh, surfotiamine, sulbutiamine, prosultiamine, and see if that changes it. Because some, some studies in animals seem to show that um, the synthesis, the active form of, thi- of thiamine is thiamine pyrophosphate. But the body, just like with vitamin B6, the cheap version that's on the market is pyro- py- uh, pyridoxine hydrochloride. But the active, for- the active form is pyridoxal 5-phosphate. The enzyme that converts the precursor to the active form, see, the, the activity seems to decline with age in disease. And the precursor itself doesn't really have that much of an effect. In fact, it can be toxic. It can be neurotoxic if you administer too high amounts. And some studies have shown, at least in animals, that if you give them massive doses of the regular thiamine, which is the either the hydrochloride salt or the mononitrate salt, um, it accumulates, but the active form, which is the thiamine pyrophosphate, it does not increase. And that is the, that is the form that is the cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase. Now, Conversely, there are studies showing that if you administer any of the more lipid-soluble precursors, there is a rapid increase in the levels of thiamine, thiamine pyrophosphate. So that will be my, you know, my, my my goal going forward is to get to the point where we can actually show that tumors can not only be stopped but fully disappear. In other words, complete regression of cancer using 100% over-the-counter pro-metabolic substances with with whose only known effect is basically effect on the you know, flow of electrons, uh, uh, mostly in the mitochondria. Do you have a fat soluble B1, form of B1 in Energen? Because I know Jaden and I both tried that. We both loved it. Right behind me, there's like, we have we have basically a, a big bag of prosultiamine, which you can look it up. It's uh, one of the fat, fat, fat soluble analogs. And we're going to be either replacing the regular thiamine or basically, uh, you know, releasing a version of Energen with that one uh, for slightly higher price, maybe. Uh, for people to try and compare. I personally like it a lot. I think we're just going to replace the regular time and just so just so that everything that we have in the product is basically the activated uh, uh, B vitamins. Yeah, I really enjoyed Energen. I know. I think you enjoyed it as well. Where can we find you? Or where can the subscribers find you? We know where to find you. Most of the blog, basically, uh, I post online under the alias Heydut, uh, spelled H-A-I-D as in dog, U-T as in Tom. So my blog is heydut.me, M-E. Uh, my blog, right? And then um, that thing feeds into my Twitter account, which is twitter.com slash heydut, again. Uh, and I also post on the Ray Pete forum, uh, I'm named under, after after Dr. Ray Pete. He's not affiliated with it, by the way, uh, in case people are wondering. It's raypeteforum, one word, dot com. And again, my alias there is heydut. So these, these three places, um, and that's pretty much it. And people can get in contact with me through these mediums if they want to exchange ideas. And Georgie sells some cool supplements from idealabs.com. Idealabsdc.com, right? Yes, yes. I tried to uh, try to get idealabs.com. It was registered. The, I contacted a person who had it. They asked for an <laughs> obscene amount of money. So because we're based in DC, 
I just registered Idea Labs DC, one word, dot com, and that's the website for the company. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your time, Georgie. Thank you for giving it to us. Yeah, it's been an honor. Hopefully we can do this again.